Welcome to our virtual service. Whether you're a member of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship on the Emerald Coast, or just a newcomer wishing to learn more about our faith, we welcome you. If you wish to receive our weekly e-newsletter, then please contact us at admin at uufec.com. Donations to support our local charities or make pledged donations to UUFEC can be mailed to UUFEC Post Office Box 205 Valparaiso, Florida 32580. Your financial support is important to us. February is often dubbed the Love Month. Too often, we think only of romantic love, hearts, valentines, and chocolates. And while all of these have their place, this month we'll be exploring more expansive definitions of love that focus on how we live our UU principles and how transformative love can change, restore, and repair lives. Our worship theme this morning is about living our values. Our guest minister is the Reverend Mark Morrison Reed. Reverend Reed served as co-minister with his wife at a number of Unitarian Universalist congregations in Rochester, New York. He is the author of edit and editor of seven books and three curricula. In 2019, at the UU Association General Assembly, he was presented with the award for distinguished service to the cause of, uni of Unitarian Universalism. In his pre-recorded sermon today, entitled, Dragged Kicking and Screaming into Heaven, Reverend Re Re Reed describes how he came to embrace the transformative love of universalism. Next week, February the 14th, Valentine's Day, we cordially invite you to join us for Side with Love Sunday. The Unitarian Universalist Association will stream an hour-long worship that will feature hymns, songs, sermon, prayers, and a time for all ages. You may download it at 10 o'clock Central Standard Time on our UUFEC Facebook page or on our website at uufec.com. The evening before, February the 13th, UUFEC members are invited to attend a special Valentine's Day movie night that's going to be held in the church parking lot. The film is The Princess Bride, a movie that's just perfect for families. Please check the January 29th e-news for details. And if you plan to attend, please RSVP to the address listed in the e-news no later than February 12th. It's bound to be a fun evening, and we hope to see you all there. And now we'll continue with our service. We affirm that love is our greatest purpose. Accepting one another is the truest form of faithful living. The search for truth is our constant star. We pledge our hearts, minds, and hands to challenge injustice with courage, to find hope in times of fear, and to live out our Unitarian Universalist values every day as a beloved community. Thus, do we covenant with each other and with all that is sacred in life. And our chalice is lit.
Good morning. So for today, for a time for all ages, we're going to do something a little bit differently. Since we're in the 30 days of love, we are uh, going to do a, a short meditation. Uh, many years ago, I got this book, and I recommend it really highly. It's called Baby Buddhas, A Guide for Teaching Meditation to Children. And uh, I did this little meditation with my grandchildren when they were very little. So it's a meta meditation, which is a Buddhist meditation for sending love out into the world. And since we're in the 30 days of love, I thought that was appropriate. So first you need to find a place to sit comfortably. So you can sit on the floor or you can sit on a little chair like I am. Just make sure that you're comfortable and that your back is straight. And whenever during this meditation, which is a guided meditation, I say, put your hands in the begging bowl. That's like this, hands together and down on your lap, like you're holding a bowl. So we'll begin. Sit quietly. May our circle be surrounded in light and love. And now we're going to take three deep breaths. Breathe in love, breathe out sadness, breathe in joy, breathe out madness, breathe in peace, breathe out badness, all the sadness, madness, and badness changes to bright white sparkles of love. Now we're going to send our healing rainbows up and out the tops of our head. So we start at the baking bowl with red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Give the rainbow anything sad, mad, or bad that you don't want, and the rainbow will change it into love. This rainbow is full of love. Let's take what we need from the rainbow and fill ourselves up with healing love. And now we're going to send all the love in the rainbow out to our whole town, people of our town, give the rainbow all of your sadness, madness, and badness, and it will change it into love. And now we send the rainbow to all the people in the United States. And now we send the rainbow all around the world, not just to people, but to all the beings in the world. And now we send the love out into the universe all the beings that we know and all the beings that we don't know. And now we bring the healing rainbow of love back inside of us. Starting with violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and back to the begging bowl. 
And now I'm going to give you some blood. And you can catch them in your begging bowl. And you can take those blessings and put them in your heart for loving feeling. Or put them in your throat for loving words. Or put them in your mind for loving thoughts. So get ready to catch your blessings. Everybody put your blessings where you need them. Breathe gently three more times. Inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale. Our world is surrounded by a healing rainbow of love. Thank you for joining me in this meditation. Trust the movement, I negate the chaos, uplift the negative, I'll show up at the table again and again and again, I'll close my mouth and learn to listen, whoa, whoa, oh, oh. whoa, whoa, oh, oh. whoa, whoa, oh, oh. Put a 
us all together make a mighty So, have you ever heard a Unitarian Universalist speak of having had a conversion experience? <laughs> yeah, have you had such an experience? Yes, thank you, thank you. Because I, good, because I think you have, even those who don't know it yet. What is it? So what is this conversion experience? It's a moment that divides one's life into a before, and an after, a moment in which there is a spiritual transformation, awakening, a shift in one's inner reality that changes the way one views the world. Such a moment one sees me and I was transformed from a Unitarian into a Universalist. And this is how it happened. This is how it happened. It was the fall of 1980. It was the annual meeting of the New York State Convention of Universalists. Donna, my wife, co-minister, and I, we arrived late, slid into the pews, and turned our attention to the Reverend Gordon McKeeman. Bucky, as we called him, was one of, among our most respected colleagues. In any case, he'd already begun to deliver the keynote address entitled The Persistence of Universalism. Well, it was just the second year of ministry for Don and I, myself. We were the co-ministers of the first Universalist Church of Rochester, New York, but we didn't know very much about universalism except what we were learning via osmosis. Of course, you know, I'd study the basics in theological school. The early church father, Origen, had argued for universal salvation. How George de Benville, the child of Huguenot refugees, after being imprisoned in Germany and France, had come here to actually this region, to Pennsylvania, and, and preached universalism for the first time in colonial America. And we knew it was a rejection of aspects of Calvinism especially it's, it's, it's angry God, and why some? You know about the ultra-universalists? They were called the death and glory school. However, since I was raised a Unitarian Chicago like Kent was, the Unitarian Universalist ethos rather than universalism is what had been bred into me. Or so I thought. So I sat there that day, having arrived late. I was admiring the stained glass windows and the carved beams, and I was half looking, half listening, certainly not expecting to be changed. Then Bucky said, universalism came to be called the gospel of God's success the gospel of the larger hope. Picturesquely spoken, the image was that of the last unrepentant sinner being dragged, screaming and kicking into heaven, unable to resist the power and love of the Almighty. Wow. Wow, what a graphic, prosaic picture. Get a divine kidnapping. Wow, you know, the last, last sinner being dragged, in my mind, by his collar, you know, dragged by his collar, I imagine, into heaven. I mean, what kind of God was this? 
And suddenly, suddenly, as I got kind of caught in this imagery, I, I, what I had learned in seminary and what I was imbibing from a truly supportive, gentle congregation came together, and I got it. This was a religion of radical and overpowering love. Universal salvation insists that no matter what we do, God so loves us that she will not and cannot consign even a single human individual to eternal damnation. Universal salvation, the reality, what as Paul Rezier says, we have a shared common destiny is the inescapable consequence of universal love. I know you use. We know you use. We grew up you use. And I know some of you are wondering, I know, what is this guy talking about? I mean, why is he using this language of love to describe this? Why describe the cosmic unfolding as love? But, but how else can we describe our feelings toward that which created, undergirds, and sustains us at every moment? What is love but our feelings for that from which we emerged are connected to and completely dependent upon? How else are we to speak of the idealized parent behind every parent, the archetypal mother and father of us all? Many contemporary Unitarian Universalists dismiss this as kind of fanciful. After all, many of us don't believe in a personal God, much less in God's love. At most, we'll see, we will see that the divine being synonymous with the natural order works in and through and among us. But ours is not a God who talks to you when you are in doubt rejoices with you when times are good or carries you through life's trials. Our God is more abstract and less personal, more a symbol and less a felt presence, more in our heads, less in our hearts. In our understanding, caring is not something that flows from God. Since God is an idea we'd rather argue over rather than an intuition that we rely upon. As former UUA president Eugene Pickett said, the old watchwords of liberalism, but freedom, you know them, reason, tolerance, describe a process for approaching the religious depths, but they testify to no intimate acquaintance with the depths themselves. Nonetheless, this is kind of smug elitism held by some humanists, some atheists who look down on those who believe in God. These sophisticated cynics portray God as what? As what? As an all-powerful, all-knowing, bearded white man enthroned in heaven and of course dismiss him as make-believe because that God is make-believe. What else? But I grow weary and I am wary of those who, who set God up as a straw man to be torn down. What is God? What is God really? God is the unbegun and the unknowable. God is the unnameable that has been given 10,000 names. God is the unfathomable and the ineffable that is as close as your next heartbeat. It's as ordinary as a mote of dust. It's as precious as a newborn. God is the transcendent mystery at the core of all things. God is the mask we place over the infinite and the garb we drape over the sacred so that we might enter into relationship with it. For we, we of all the manifestation of this 
yes, eternally unfolding creation are blessed to awaken to and knowingly witness and savor a miracle. And you know what that miracle is. It's life. Life. Your life. Our lives. And then in transmitting and building upon the creation with our own lives, we seek to address the divine mystery that is both parent and partner. And so we say, our Father. The Japanese say, Kami. Muslims say, Allah. We say, Hail Mary, Gaia, Jesus, Abba, Shiva, Brahma. One of Elie Wiesel's novels ends with this line. God created man because he loves stories. <laughs> huh? Right, 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 right. I mean, this is, this is to say what? God is relational? Relational, and we say it that way because we actually find it more believable when we invert reality, or we, you know, we turn it this way. God did not make us in her image. We made her in whose? We made her in ours. But why? Why? So that we can identify with and relate to her. So we can address and be spoken to. So we can love and be loved by. That's the way we are built. God, which is how we speak of experiencing the mystery behind all things, must be relational because we are relational. The bond we feel to another human being, which is the first thing we learn in our mother's arms, is the prototype for all our relationships. And to the degree that we as Unitarian Universalists allow the intellectual to tyrannize our faith, we fail to address this primal human need for intimate connection and sense of belonging. I pray, I pray to the God that dwells within, among, and beyond us. I pray to God for the same reason I write my diary, talk to a friend, spend a quiet moment in reflection because what I know of God, I find in communion with myself, those I love, and with this world in which I move and love and have my being. I talk with God because I need to relate to this world that is within and beyond me. I want to experience its realness and its dearness. And you, you abstractions of God simply don't meet my emotional needs or lead me into a sacred place. Even being, actually, especially being as analytic as I am at this very moment, is to step away from the immediate experience of God rather than into the divine mystery. But a God, and this is why this image was so powerful, the God who drags the last unrepentant sinner kicking and screaming, no, actually profanely cursing and resisting into heaven. I could envision, I bet you could too. I can admire, we can have confidence in, we have feelings about, Hell, we can even laugh at. It's a personification of the most holy rooted in a powerful, sometimes overwhelming feeling and experience that ultimately tr transcends description, a yearning that defies analysis. What a relief to feel that ultimately there is nothing, nothing, nothing I can do to alienate myself from God's loving embrace the almighty but tender arms of the creative force that upholds and sustains all life. So universalism's insight is that you cannot coerce people into loving one another. The commandments are not threats. They are, they are not fulfilled. God will not withdraw a love that is all encompassing. No one has ever, no one will ever draw true love from another person with punishment. Think about it. God's love 
but the gift of the cosmos is a given to all and is a more positive force for good than fear will ever be. Love is not just stronger than fear, though. It is stronger than death. Love survives and love thrives and abides in us. And thus all the departed reside within us. Behind this is simple truth. It's very simple, and you know it already. In being loved, what? We learn to love. Those who are loved will in turn love others. Those who feel God's infinite love within themselves will in turn feel so good about themselves, so connected to life, so full of compassion that they will not be able but to help but spread that love. It will overflow from them. This is a belief the world needs today as much as ever. The image of the sinner being dragged into heaven transformed how I saw the world because it took what did it actually took my early experience of being raised and being loved in a context embedded in a Unitarian community and it made that paramount. Henceforth, I could say, I will make mistakes and fail. And I have. I will disappoint others and myself. And I do. I will do thoughtless, hurtful things too often. You know, I may be scorned by the world. I may be no good and rotten to the core I may reject the love that is offered me, and still, 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 I am sustained by the creation that made us all. Universalism, which is a gospel of inclusion that proclaims God's enduring, forgiving, undaunted love in the face of all that. So what has puzzled me then is why that didn't sweep the world. Why that didn't sweep the world. You know, we were huge once in North America, but why in the boom, it did have its boom in the first half of the 19th century, did it collapse? Why is it the afterthought in Unitarian Universalism? Why is Universalism and its proclamation of unconditional, uncompromising, all-embracing, overpowering, divine love more difficult to believe in than the virgin birth? Why is it easier to believe in the unbelievable than to believe we are one human family beloved by God? Why? Why? What we yearn for, what each of us yearns for is unconditional love. But, you know, that's contradicted by our experience. Instead, the principal message each of us received, and we received it over and over and over again, was this. You behave and be loved, and you behave and be loved, and you behave and be loved. The implication is those who are good and compliant are loved, others not. In other words, people have taken their own experience of conditional, judgmental, imperfect human love and ascribed that to God. You know, now and then, now and then, Someone comes along who lives by the spirit of love rather than the letter of the law. So there's this interview with uh, Pope Francis in which he said, a person once asked me, you've heard this probably, in a provocative manner if I approved of homosexuality. And I replied with another question. Tell me, when God looks at a gay person, does he endorse the existence of this person with love? or reject and condemn this person. We must always consider the person where we enter into the mystery of the human. Here we enter into the mystery of the human being. In life, God accompanies persons, and we must accompany them starting from their situation. It is necessary to accompany them with mercy. Pope Francis, and I was reading that, and I began crying. And suddenly I understood why in 1997 I was at St. Peter's and I was standing 
before the tomb, and it's an unadorned tomb of John the 23rd. And I had started crying at that moment, and I never understood why until this moment. And in my heart, at least, I recognized that they were both manifestations, manifestations of a loving God. Today, given the insane rates of in incarceration in America, the, you know, the highest in the world, given draconian, draconian immigration policies, given the ongoing strife, what with Boko Haram in Nigeria, the decades-old conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, the war, what for in Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, the tensions in the Ukraine, universalism is as important as ever. The world needs to know that God's love is boundless and our connection to one another is fundamental. But what? We have abandoned the language and retreated from this ancient proclamation. Now, theism, I think, think God talk, okay? God talk offers religious language liberals a language to carry into the world. I think it's actually kind of handy. Uh, it's useful language because it's frankly the vernacular of most people. Pew Fund tells us 96 of the American people, hell, 72% of Unitarian Universalists can rate to God in some form. So if we say God and say God is love and God loves you and you and every member of the human family and people will at least have an inkling of what we mean. Yeah, the world needs, the world needs to hear about this faith that soothes wounded hearts and shapes attitudes that embody a spirit of love rather than that of wrath. And facing this kind of neo-tribalism, we need a message that challenges the axis of evil rhetoric, contradicts the us versus them mentality that is so rampant in our political life today and proclaims the oneness of the human family. You know, you know this, there is only us. Us, beloved by God, who dismissing free will, I'm sorry, this is hard for you to hear, dismissing free will, you got me correct, you don't get to decide on this, embraces the despicable and the saintly, created both Mother Teresa and Muammar Gaddafi, cheers both Obama and Putin, loves both Bush and now dead Bin Laden, and drags Hitler into heaven as well. This is a truth almost too shocking for us to assimilate. But beneath all our diversity, behind all our differences, there is a unity which makes us one and binds us forever together in spite of time and death and the space between the stars. It was to the unrelenting tug of this reality that I know as God that I gladly submitted that long ago day. May the love that gives to life its beauty, the reverence that gives to life its sacredness, and the purposes that give life its deep significance be strong within each of us and lead us into ever-deepening relationships with all of life. Amen. Yeah.
Answering 